Thank you. Uh, what? Hammer time. Thank you, Ames. I got to tell you, Ames has been a dear friend for a very long time. And he invites me every year to come here. I think this is my fifth straight year. And um, I got to tell you, I, I, I eagerly want to come. And I want, want to come in every year that he will have me or that you will have me. Because I can't tell you uh, what I get out of this meeting. You know, you all come, you listen to speakers and all of that. But, but just talking to you, I was just sitting with Faith. Uh, uh, just a minute ago and the things that I was getting out of her the energy that I get from you is just amazing you are the people that are on the front lines of, of uh, what's going on in Oregon and I know it's a tough battle because of Oregon politics uh, and, and Oregon's a tough state for conservatives especially Christian conservatives uh, and, and, it, and it's tough but you're there, you're fighting for what you believe in you understand your world view and, and you're fighting with anything and everything that's uh, within you uh, to make these things happen uh, and, and uh, defend the Lord and defend the conservative movement. So I'm sort of running out of messages, but I got a big message today uh, because of where we are today. And you're going to get some incredibly good speakers, uh, Governor Jim uh, Gilmore and, and Bob McEwen, former congressman. Uh, from Ohio, and, um, and just so uh, just sit back and enjoy them, the entertainment. They're just wonderful speakers. Uh, but I, I really got a serious message. And the way I thought about how do I set this up, and I may be repeating myself from years in the past, but I, 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 you, you need to understand that the message I'm giving you is from the heart and from the experience uh, of being in politics ever since really 1976. Uh, when I was uh, a precinct chairman in Simonton, Texas, uh, which sounds impressive, but there were only five Republicans in the entire uh, county. And my wife and I and another couple and a, a little old lady whose husband was a Democrat, there were only five, five in the whole county because my home county, they didn't elect Republicans, they shot them, um, especially back then, and that's another whole story. Um, but I ran for office. I, w I, was, uh, I had a pest control company. Um, Jason, are you here? I don't see Jason, who's a con running for uh, Congress. He's got a pest control. I killed bugs for a living. Uh, I didn't know at the time that it was great experience for what I ended up doing. <laughs> but, but the Lord, is, uh, even when I wasn't walking with the Lord, uh, he was always there protecting me and putting me in positions like this. But, I, you know, I, much like today, back then, uh, I was trying to just raise my family and uh, build my business and, and enjoy the, the American dream. Uh, but every time I turned around, the local government, the, the county government, the, the state government, the, the federal government was interfering with my ability to, to, to grow and realize the American dream. So I decided the government was a cost of doing business, and I better get involved in it in one way. In fact, I got my accountant to put cost of government on my profit and loss statement. And those of you that own a business, I encourage you to do that, because you're gonna find out, as I did back then, that 60% of my gross income went to government, either, either through regulation or taxation. And I was spending zero amount of time uh, uh, of trying to affect that cost of government. So I decided I better get involved one way or another. Make a long story short, I ran for the state legislature in 1978 in a county that had never elected a Republican. I, did, I did, wasn't smart enough to know that I couldn't uh, get elected in that county. But I ran. I got a book. I'm one of those weirdos that read instructions before I put something together. I didn't know how to run a campaign. Somebody gave me a book on campaigns. I read the book, and I literally ran a textbook campaign. And in, and in those days in Fort Bend County, Texas, just outside of, 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 of uh, Houston, Texas, they'd never seen a real grassroots campaign. And uh, we snuck up on them, and I won in 1978. Um, 
There's a lot of great stories there, but my, my point is, is that at the time, in 1979, now Texas, I know, Jeff, you're bragging about Oregon, but Texas has also got a great uh, system. It, we, the legislature in the state of Texas only meets 140 days every two years. Yes. Keep them out of, of the Capitol building. Yeah, you're much better off. Uh, but I was elected, sworn in, served my first term uh, as a state representative, um, and boy, was I full of myself. Man, I thought I was 32 years old. I, I was a state representative. I had just finished my first session and it was very successful. I was so full of myself. I, you can, I mean, you would have, if, if you pricked me with a, a, a pen, I would have blown up because my head was so blown up. And, and it was all about me. I was the most self-centered jerk that you, that you could imagine. Got involved in all the stuff, the shenanigans that goes on in the state legislature. I'll never forget the first my first Rotary Club meeting after I came back from Austin, Texas, after 140 days, uh, the program was an interesting program. It was these high school students that were taking an extracurricular course who were rumbling. What is the rumbling? Yeah. I know it's wind. <laughs> Oregon wind. Anyway, my, the, the, here I am in my Rotary Club, and we're, uh, we're, uh, the, the program is these high school kids, these beautiful high school kids that were taking a course, an extracurriculum course in the, in the Constitution. A guy named Cleon Skousen had this program. There you go. Cleon Skousen had this program uh, after school. If you studied the, a certain level of the Constitution, you got a $250 uh, uh, um, scholarship and and so these kids were going to show their prowess in the constitution and they stood up in front of my rotary club and the first question out of this beautiful uh, high school seniors mouth was how many amendments are there to the constitution of course nobody raised their hand nobody could and, and uh, answer it and i could not answer that question it so embarrassed me and so challenged me that i took their course but it taught me from that day forward that the Constitution was the most important thing that I could be doing is standing on that Constitution. And my entire career was centered around the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Now, I'm going to set that aside for a moment. Because I served six years in the state legislature. I ran for Congress, and I won. And I, as I admitted to you, I was the most self-centered jerk that you can imagine. I wasn't in Congress three weeks. And this congressman by the name of Frank Wolf had this little ministry. He would go around and knock on the door of the freshman members, Democrat and Republican. And, and you had to let him in because he was a senior men, member. You weren't going to tell him no. And, he, and he'd come in and he'd talk to you about family and how important it was to protect your family. And he showed me this video. Now, I'm not walking with the Lord in any way. But he showed me this video of James Dobson called Where's Daddy? And everything bad about Daddy that James Dockerson talked about was me. He was describing me. And I just totally broke down uh, because I knew from then that I needed something more than what I had. And, and uh, five months later, I came to Christ in a very real way in 1985, and I've been walking with him ever since. Now, the reason I tell you that The reason I would tell you that is the Lord was preparing me for what I was about to go through. And he was preparing me not only for my professional career, because I was really walking with him. I was learning and studying and, and growing and, and walking. And, and uh, I, I mean, I, I ran into Dr. Bill Bright. He had written a book called Red Sky in the Morning that convinced me why God created this country. It's not for your and my comfort. He created this country. Uh, so that we would be in an affluent country and we could pay to spread the gospel around the world. That's why he created this country. And, 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 and so I jumped on Bill Bright's and, and started, the, uh, he had this group called Christian Embassy that really is what uh, helped me come to Christ. And we had a, 
uh, a weekly Bible study there, there in the house uh, chambers um, that we would go to, and they would lead us. And and and, uh, and, and, and what we were learning were, was preparing me, at least, for what I was about to face. Then I ran into Chuck Colson, who had written a book called How Now Shall We Live? That was all about worldview and, and understanding your worldview. And once you understood your worldview, standing up and fighting for that worldview. I taught it at my ch church several times. I brought lectures fr from uh, uh, Chuck Colson to the House of Representatives and exposed this uh, book and worldview to members of Congress, uh, members of the House, and members of the Senate, um, uh, and to the staff. Of, of the uh, House of Representatives and, and, and the Senate and, and bringing, trying to get God back into the public square. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are reaping the consequences of allowing this country for the last 150 years, and some could say 200 years, of kicking God out of the public square. Now, Faith, I just saw Faith. Where are you, Faith? There she is right there. She was telling me, about the faith and Christian heritage and stuff like that. God created the Declaration of Independence and God created the Constitution. The, the, and, and without God, none, we will never win this battle that we're in. We have to understand that. Because as I went through, and we took the majority for the first time in 60 years in 1994, and we became the Republican majority, we, uh, we were on offense. We had the contract with America, and part of that was welfare reform. And we understood, being on offense, that welfare was destroying families, destroying children, destroying marriages. I mean, the government was paying women to have children and make sure that the father of their children had uh, stayed away from them or they lost their welfare. I mean, it, the government itself had designed a way to destroy the families uh, of those that are on welfare. But we reformed it. We went after it. And we took m uh, under, under uh, an, a unique philosophy. If you ask people to go to work, they actually will go to work. And millions of people have uh, left welfare since uh, the 1900s because of the welfare reform, and they're all for welfare. Now, Obama reversed the work requirement in just a stroke of the pen. Um, and, and completely negated everything that we did. But we, were, we did the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Within two years, the American uh, budget was balanced, and within uh, uh, five years, we had a $650 billion surplus in this country. Now, Bill Clinton took credit for all of this, but it was the conservatives in the House of Representatives using the power of the purse in an aggressive offense against the world view of the progressives. Now, Trevor Loud, Loud was here, and I think he's coming on again this afternoon, talking about these kinds of things and how the, the whole history of the progressives, and I don't have time to get into that right now. But you know the progressives. It's been 130 years for the progressives to bring us to where we are today. And certainly in the last six years with Obama as president, it has accelerated. Their agenda has won ladies and gentlemen, and they're destroying this country. And the, my message is we have to get back on offense. We can no longer cede our country to the left. We have to stand up against them in so many different ways. And the most important way is to bring God back into the public square. As Benjamin Franklin said, God, God governs in the affairs of men. God governs in the affairs of men. That was Ben Franklin, who the progressives have tried to destroy and say that he didn't believe in God. Of course he did. He was the person that when the, when the uh, Constitutional Congress was in, in deadlock, uh, he stood up and, and called for prayer. And, and so they all went home and they, they got on their knees. And the next day they came and, and we have a Constitution. It was God that was guiding those men in that chamber. And, and it was God that, that created this country. And it was God that has been, and being kicked out of, of, of the public square is why we have, we've allowed that to happen 
And without God, we will not win. I guarantee you, without God, we have to focus on that. And we have, to, and, and so there's, I've been traveling the country calling for spiritual revival. And guess what? In the last year, uh, especially, I have seen this spiritual revival happening all over, all over the country. Pastors are now standing up. More and more pastors are standing up and speaking from the pulpit about the conditions of our country. Pastors are understanding that God created three institutions, family, church, and the civil government. And, and we are, it's not a duty, an American duty. It is an assignment from God that we focus on the family, the church, and civil government. And it's our responsibility as believers uh, to be involved in those three institutions. It's not, and, and we can't be afraid of the federal government or losing our tax status or whatever it's, they're going to do to us, put us in jail in my case, or, or uh, you know, destroy your reputation or destroy your profession or whatever. We cannot, we can no longer allow that to happen. And, we can, and so we've got to fight up. Now, now, how do we fight? We go on offense. We have a revolution for the Constitution. A revolution for the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen. We are at a point. We are at a point in the history of the United States where the grand debate is happening, but many of our fellow American citizens don't understand it. The progressives have brought us to this point because they want to shred the Constitution. Obama says it's a living document. And the worldview of, of, of the progressive is basically whatever's good for society. And guess what? The people in charge and in power get to decide what's good for, for society. Trumps in the individual. That's their worldview. That's why we have the government, the huge governments that we have. Not just the federal government, but state and local. Uh, messing in our lives. The thing that drives me crazy about Oregon, Jeff, is that the government dictates who puts gas in your car. I mean, it just amazes me. Uh, but the point is, at every level, we have ceded it to the progressives. We have ceded, our schools are a mess, absolutely a mess. But the conservatives have ceded education to the progressives, to where now we have the public school system is just in devasta is devastated. Our universities, we've given it to uh, our universities, to the left and to the progressives and to the Marxists and to the communists, whatever you, you want to call them. We've just given it up. We, we're constantly on defense, trying to slow them down. We can no longer do that. We have to be on offense. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean about offense. If you look at what the Democrats are doing right now, the war on women, accusing the Republicans because we won't give free contraceptives, We're, we have a war, uh, contraceptives, we have a war on women. Uh, uh, war, the, the Republicans hate Hispanics because of immigration. Uh, uh, the, the Republicans hate uh, African Americans because we want to reform welfare. And we, we are constantly on defense. We won't raise the minimum wage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what, the way you do offense is we have to stand up and say, okay, after Obama, 16 million women are on food, food stamps. Two out of five single mamas are on food stamps. The health care costs for these women are going through the roof, skyrocketing. It's Obama's war on women because of his philosophy and his worldview, and it must be stopped. Uh, Anti-Hispanic. You stand up and you say, after five years of Obama, eight million Hispanics are on food stamps. Twenty million Hispanics are unemployed, and health care continues to skyrocket, and it has to be stopped. And I ha don't have time to get into it, and others will talk about it. Look at every major city in America. It, they are bankrupt. They are destitute. They are liberal hellholes. Look at Detroit. 
if that's not a war on African Americans, I don't know. Look at our national capital. Have you ever gone to the national capital and actually got into the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C.? Poverty is rampant. Gangs are rampant. Crime is rampant. It's all because of the liberal philosophy. It is a war on African Americans. Obama's war on African Americans, and it has to be stopped. So we have to stand up and take the offense. And we have to do it on every level. We have an election. You've got people running for office. You got maybe, I don't know about Oregon, but maybe you have, like some states, you have a school board election. And, and I'm not going to tell you, but your organizations need to come up with three to five issues you are demanding that will happen uh, uh, here in Oregon. One of the suggestions I've made is, is go to the school board and say, stop fighting uh, the ACLU on taking prayer out of schools. Go on the offense. Put the Bible in back in the schools. Put the Bible back in the schools. If you're running for state legislature, or state senator, or governor candidates, stand up and ask them, are you going to clean out the universities? That's, our, that's offense. Clean out the communists out of the universities in Oregon, uh, all across this nation. That, I'm just making suggestions and using examples of being on offense. And, of course, the Fed. And we talked about this last year. The people running for Congress, ask them most importantly, how many amendments are there to the Constitution? <laughs> what does the Constitution mean to you? When you stand on the Constitution, uh, how does that translate into what goes on in Washington, D.C.? The federal government in Washington is unconstitutional. And as I said last year, we have to shut it down and rebuild a new constitutional government in America and get them pledged to it. Make them do it. So my message is to you, spiritual revival, bring God back into the public arena, and secondly, a revolution for the Constitution. God bless you. Go get them. Congressman Tom DeLay.